to give us time to reflect and kind of begin maybe your questions if you have them written down. Um, I'm going to put together, as you have, uh, uh, as panelists have already done, put together the last questions. Great. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. And if you could um, please consider um, reflecting on the 50 years since, okay, <laughs> how and in what ways did this experience influence your decisions, the whole range, yeah. uh, and what was the tipping point, if there was one, when you m moved from being a bystander to taking action in whatever ways you want to talk about it and become a voice of change? And if you could address okay. that, yep. that I think would lead us to good questions. Okay. This is so great. It's amazing. <laughs> um, I, there was a saying back in the 60s, that, which it was obvious, but maybe not. The personal is political. And I think that one of the things that is probably the most important for me is the intersection between the personal and the political on, in, in every area. So that, that's the, kind of been my exploration since then. Um, the, one of the things I want to kind of check off or point out for myself is there exists, for me anyway, my experience has been that um, I had to deal with the um, emotional fallout of the shame of being the sex goddess <laughs> tramp person. You know, the unalluring sex goddess. Um, <laughs> and I, I think what has come out of that for me is a sense of the way that we as change agents interact with the things that we have been taught, both the spoken things and the unspoken things. And that's true both personally and institutionally with the institutions that we're in. Because I've found that there's always kind of a shadow existing for within of the things that we're, we're trying to change these things and usually they're somewhere inside of us at the same time. And so that's led to a lifelong interest in the process of self-reflection individually and institutionally and a, a try at inventing processes for for, for working on that. And that's really the, fu function, the focus of my work now, aside from I am an artist also, and, and that's what keeps me sane. So, so I think that self-reflection on, on how these things that I'm trying to change exist within me and how I'm trying not to think about them is something that I'm still doing. And honestly, being here, this is the second time that I've had a chance to kind of open up my own, um, his, my own resistance to myself that has been a, a, like a 50-year product of that experience. I went to, the first one was I went to an exhibition on 1968 in Philadelphia, it's a big exposition, and there's 1968 plastered across the, and I kind of had a culture shock because it, because we were bad children at the time that we did these things. Bad children. Some of us had, you know, it really had big effects on, and, and our parents didn't like it, and they stopped paying for things. I mean, it was, it was big. It was a big shift. So how to do that. And then I think the other thing about this whole thing that I want to, well, and I want to say, the, the other thing that, we, that comes with being an activist is being able to be part of a, of a community of a kind of love that's based on trying to make change in the world, trying to do something that matters, and being able to be around. I mean, the people on this panel, the women on this panel, clearly you can hear the love of what they're doing in the way that they speak. And that, to me, is the, the reason to be an activist, is to be able to create that. And I think the only other thing I would say is, I think young people, young people today, have, <laughs> have less, uh, have been given less encouragement to invent themselves than we were given. There was a lot of, of encouragement, 
I don't know why, but we, I think we felt like we could do anything and invent anything, and when we came up against roadblocks, we looked for ways around them. And, and I wanna say that that is still possible, and I offer myself, and, I, and I, I'm sure my colleagues would also, I offer myself as an encouragement resource for you, so remember that. So that's all I got. I just want to allude to something I mentioned earlier. Um, two things that happened right after uh, the, the strike and the evacuation of the building and the arrest. I don't know how many of you remember it, but after the arrest day, there was a march uh, up to Columbia of solidarity, this is what, what uh, Grace is talking about, of solidarity of college students all over New York City. Yeah. And it was really striking. Um, I just have to tell you one little story, it's pretty funny. I have no idea why I was near the top, I was not a leader, why I was near the top of the march. But for those of you who know anything about Columbia politics, at one point Mike Sovereign, who was then a young labor law professor at Columbia, um, approached me and he said, yeah. What, what do you want? And I'm here to try to solve this. And I screamed. Um, uh, my, my first claim to fame, I've been in the newspaper several times since, but my first claim to fame was the New York Times did have an, uh, a line that said, Barnard co-eds were heard screaming obscenities at the police officers and Columbia officials. I proudly claim to be one of those Barnard co -eds. Interesting. So Mike Sovereign, uh, who I came to know later, was actually, and some of you know, was a very important person here at Columbia, um, was actually trying to, to do what I now do, and that was to try to mediate it. And I screamed, you know, get away from us. Um, and it was what Grace was just talking about, the solidarity of the, I don't know how many there were, thousands of other college students made you feel like you were part of something bigger. So that's some of what Grace said. I just want to add to that. What The strength that we get, the exhilaration, is from knowing that you're in something bigger. Now the second strand I alluded to earlier was the second thing that happened after the strike was the first meeting of Columbia's Women Liberation, which I went to, and Kate Stimson was there and Kate Millett and a woman named Carolyn Hilbrin who did not have an appointment in the English department but taught at the College of General Studies and known to some of you perhaps as Amanda Cross. She wrote mm. mysteries under a pseudonym because she thought it would hurt her academic career if she was known to be writing um, unserious mysteries. They are fabulous. They are, um, <laughs> they are all uh, stories about real people, if you know who they are. Um, and uh, later in life, I got to know her a little bit. Um, and so I, what I want to say is that at the time that I was as politically engaged and proud of it and arguing with my parents and my professors at Barnard, uh, may she rest in peace. Uh, Gladys Meyer was my mentor. She was a sociologist. She'd been radical in her day. And she yelled at me and said, you people think this is the 1930s. But this, <laughs> but this is not serious. This is nothing more than a Columbia Barnard panty raid that happens every year, and you're oh. not serious. So this is not the humiliation mm -hmm. part, but developing strength from this. I was only a freshman. I'm, you know, it's mm -hmm. class of 71. My arguing back at her um, and realizing that, and this is for any of the younger women in the room, uh, every generation has to make its own ways of doing things. And, mm -hmm. and you know, my, my parents were of that generation, and I thought, well, the 30s were important. They uh, didn't solve things, as it produced Nazism and World War II. <laughs> and we, we really believed. So I want to say this to you. In the morning after the arrest, when we were walking around here in our blankets, I truly believe, and this is just before France 68, we haven't mentioned that yet, mm -hmm. I truly believe the revolution was happening. Mm -hmm. There was something in the air, really. Uh, the police had come, and then this solidarity march of um, hundreds and maybe, I don't know, thousands of students elsewhere. I really, really believed that we were making a revolution. Now, we were in New York City, and you know, our little enclave here, and it turned out not to be, but as you know, Cornell, uh, Harvard, Penn, Berkeley, all of them, uh, also had strikes in 1970 after the Cambodia um, uh, Gulf of Tonkin bo bombing. Many, many universities closed down. So there actually was a spirit at the time that things were really going to change very dramatically. And the one thing that didn't change dramatically until the first meeting of the Columbia's Women's Liberation was to be working on political issues and at the same time to see the gendered nature of mm -hmm. things. Um, and so I work parallel, as you heard, I taught women's studies for many years. Um, and I just want to add that the other thing that I have done in my life that was informed by this, as a lawyer, I was one of the founding members of the critical legal studies movement, which in the 70s and 80s was a um, lefty movement of law professors 
then divided into critical race studies um, as the minority law professors, at first black, then Latino, formed critical lat crit. Um, and then we formed a, a feminist critical group that wrote scholarship and theory. So other things that we needed to do out of that period was to theorize what we were doing. And what it was, if anything, that women brought to this movement, or these movements, plural, that men did not. And for me, those things happen simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So while I remain engaged in uh, racism, civil, uh, the civil rights movement totally not finished by any means, uh, anti-war movements still, and uh, political movements, ultimately for me, doing a lot of very establishment work in Washington, D.C., it's also important to keep, as I said earlier, the radical parts of the movement and to understand the movements are not all the same for all people. When the white students left Hamilton Hall, that was a very important moment at Barnard, Barnard Organization of Soul Sisters, some of them in the audience here. Um, we were one of the first, this college. I was very proud of it. Um, for, um, uh, for, uh, for the black women um, establishing a, an identity of their own at Barnard. And so these movements change and evolve, and people need to participate in different ways, and they also need to be theorized and to realize that we're not alone. There was France 68. It was, in some respects, much more violent. As some of you know, bricks thrown, people were hurt, and also had a somewhat lasting effect on French politics. And I still believe that, hopefully, despite current conditions, we can continue to try to accomplish some of that in the United States. <laughs> I'd like to go back and pick up on a phrase um, which came from the end of the panel, uh, but we heard it several times um, this morning, uh, young people. Uh, the black students on Columbia and Barnard's campuses were very lucky. Like almost all students, they were the young people on the block. And uh, this poses some interesting questions, I think, overall, as we list the things you can do, the things we did do, the things we won successfully. Uh, and it's a kind of irony of American culture that we force our young people to fight for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't take the fight. We make our children fight us. Yeah, <laughs> right. What's going on here? Yeah, and we need to look at that. Uh, sometimes you don't have to fight and you negotiate. Mm -hmm. But negotiation doesn't always work. And then you have to fight. So there are troubling issues here for all movements to look at and for individuals to look at. You know, one thing I wanted to say today is I, I wanted to say and ask the women in the audience uh, to please raise your children with ethics and fairness. Yeah. Because it appears that these issues get embedded in these new babies very early, and they come from us. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the good thing is that, the good thing and the bad thing is that it's an uneven fight for kids. It is. But then there's David and Goliath. <laughs> Creativity back to culture, inspiration, and art. Thank you. So I think they're all very hard things to follow. I'll do it quickly. Um, uh, keep thinking there's a microphone in front of me. You know, maybe you must be able to hear. So the, we were supposed to talk. Uh, I'm, I wrote down some things about you know, the ways in which, you know, maybe I was a change agent, you know, over the course of my years um, as a professional and a parent. I'll say something about that in a minute. Um, but I, you know, I, I think that, um, 
you know, my, my generation, our generation of women, um, learned how to cope. Um, you know, even though we went on to, you know, we fought the battles here, and we continued, as you've heard, you know, to fight battles, you know, in our fields and in our personal lives over the last 50 years. Um, one of the things that I had to deal with, and I dare say that's true of many of you in this room, I, you know, one of the things I had to address was the very worried entreaties of my mother mm -hmm. um, that when I graduated, I should be getting married, I should have children uh, right away, and I should be a school teacher in that order. So, you know, my mother who passed away uh, less than two years ago, it took her decades to mm -hmm. tell me, which she eventually did, that she was proud of my work. Mm -hmm. um, but in spite of that, you know, and this was a woman who's, you know, it's not like we had unshared values. We had shared values, but paramount to her was that I be a woman. You know, and the other stuff, you know, you can do that later after the kids are in college. I didn't choose to do that, and most of us didn't choose to, to do that. We pushed ahead. Um, we were brave. And I, you know, as I look back on it all now, I say, I didn't expect anybody to take care of me. Mm. You know, I knew that we were out there, and we were on our own, and we couldn't rely on systems or boyfriends or husbands or parents because we were in, to one degree or another, you know, kind of shattering uh, barriers, you know, as we sort of, as we moved ahead um, in our lives. And I say lastly, you know, I couldn't agree with you more about um, the importance of raising uh, empathetic um, and socially conscious children. I have three of them two sons and a daughter, uh, who I'm proud of every day. Um, and I'm glad I didn't wait as long as uh, I would otherwise, had it not been for my mother. Um, so, <laughs> and I think I'd just like to end it there. Thank you. We've seen the lessons and reflections that they have. We'd like to know what your thoughts are. If you have questions that you've written down, can you kind of bring them? Okay, great, great. Um, and then afterwards, please ask us your questions or share among you your, uh, your own reflections on it. Um, but I did want to add that uh, considerations between reform and revolution those are vital and fundamental questions that you answered, not in one big fell swoop, mm. but every day, okay? Every day. And you can see the considerations they've given. In terms of intersections and connections of causes for justice, we live with them every day. And so every day there's an opportunity to extend those alliances for justice in our society, in our homes, and our communities, as well as reflections on our identity as women, you know, with the benefits of education, but also with the barriers that are wrapped around us from our education, and those we negotiate every day. So I'm taking from the panelists encouragement to engage, encouragement to engage, and that the progress toward this justice is done every day, okay? Um, but let us talk about the questions, if you will, okay? Now we have, in light of the need to be creative and the night of the need, uh, the uh, in light of the Time's Up movement, the, uh, the loss of Hillary, uh, progress that has been made. What do we do individually to remove the lasting vestiges of sexism and racism? Okay. 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 Well, no problem. Well, let's let's break let's break it down to the most important points you would you would want to make with with people who are like you know like minded and interested. Most important points. Would you like to address them? Okay, I'm just gonna say one little, one little thing in addition to the, 
trust to yourself and go and keep going and find allies is I think these midterm elections are going to be really, really important. And, and we usually don't really, so that's what I, that's what I got to say. Yeah, I would say the same thing. My husband is a Democratic political consultant, uh, which as you can imagine, since I'm more radical, um, you know, is, has been an interesting uh, 47 years of marriage. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, I, I can't uh, underscore more than what Grace said, and I would say to each of you, wherever you live, and if you live here in liberal New York, um, go, go get in a car and go canvas someplace else. When I lived in Washington, we went canvassing in Virginia, uh, and as you know, Obama carried the state. Every little, every little bit of activity helps now in California. Uh, my colleagues go to Nevada and Arizona, places that were deeply Republican, and I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to be making political arguments here, but I think I'm among mostly friends. Um, and, uh, and, and for those of us that were more outside uh, political activists and anti-war movements and the feminist movement and civil rights movement, um, you know, what I've learned from my husband all these years, and living in Washington for a very long time, is the core and the mainstream matters. Every single day we wake up to news of the destruction of values and institutions that it took this country 200 years not to get right, to keep working on. Um, and uh, if you're like me and you feel totally demoralized every morning, this is hard. We talk about exhilaration and humiliation and a lot of it is also perspiration. Um, it really, really requires everybody to do just something. So for those of you who can't walk anymore, I'm beginning to be one of those, my hips are going. Um, if you can give money to campaigns, not just in your own locality, but to some of the districts where there's a potential to flip the district, as we're calling it. Um, so financial support, phone calling, getting the vote out, all of that. Uh, my husband wouldn't believe I'm making this big political speech. Um, but I want to underscore what Grace said. That stuff matters. And then the other thing I would just say, wherever you are, whether you're retired, whether you're still working, whether you have kids or grandkids, Every little place that you, uh, that you are, including the coffee place that you go to, the yoga class that you go to, my yoga class, even though we're in California, not everybody agrees. Um, if you can have informed, polite conversations with people who disagree with you and just try to flip somebody about one issue about this election or something really important. If we can... If we can really uh, uh, move on to one, mm -hmm. two more, actually two more questions brief, and then open it up, please. Um, one, someone is asking about the impact of the women of the Black Panther Party uh -huh. and their engagement in terms of leadership and their sacrifice in terms of hardship in the course of struggle. Uh, they're referring to Betty Shabazz, Malcolm X, and they're also talking about um, the Barnard uh, administration's involvement with the, uh, 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 with the black students, whether it's Boss and it, they, our, our inheritors. But if you could uh, talk a little bit about the influences, the influences coming from uh, uh, radical influences, especially in the Black Panther Party, but others. Can, can you speak? Yeah. Um, I just saw Kathleen Cleaver. She's, she's up and around, and she's teaching in the South. And uh, I don't think she regrets a moment of her life. Uh, um, I think there are two things to look at. One is that uh, I, I applied for a teaching job. I taught at Hunter for 10 years, but before that, I did in a number of interview rounds, and uh, one of my interviewers, a very famous art historian in New York, said, I have, at the end of it, said, I have one burning question to ask of you. It's just something I can't figure out. And I said, yeah. And she said, uh, how is it that black people like you can have friends like H. Rap Brown and Stokely Carmichael and blah, 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 blah. And, uh, and that's true. Uh, Stokely was a friend, was in my house. He came and asked my father for permission to pluck one of his daughters to the Southern Voter Registration Drive in the 60s. She went. 
and uh, did a lot of good there too. So it was a fair question, I thought. And she said, but then she added, um, because if he were my friend, I would be out of this university. They would fire my ass like quick. Mm. And I was kind of stunned at the rawness of the uh, comment and the question itself, actually. But there is something of interest in it because I think we have to understand that whenever black people show up, it's radical. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for your support. I appreciate that. <laughs> it makes a difference. Yeah. If, if I could ask a question, because some, uh, several people asked about the situation today mm -hmm. with Barnard and Columbia. One person referenced an incident over in uh, Fernald, Fernald Hall. Uh, another person referenced um, what the uh, Mexico, City, uh, Mexico City students had done before our strike. But uh, there's also another one concerning uh, uh, today, concerning the uh, department uh, uh, run ideologues, okay, who are apparently are becoming outspoken about all of the issues, many of them we dealt with, and the student groups who were barred from protesting and the Manhattan influence that is, can someone talk a little bit about a couple of the situations that we're facing today in relationship to awareness of what Barnett and Columbia are doing. Yeah. Um, let me say a few words. I, I don't know, I know a little bit about what's going on at Barnett and Columbia, but I do want to um, say that it's a very troubled time at universities and not troubled in the way that we lived in. Uh, for those of you who don't live your lives in universities, universities are in fact the, pl the place where there's the least amount of free speech right now. Um, you all, if you've been following the news at all, political correctness is just unbelievable. I'm at the University of California, the, the, the birth of the free speech movement at Berkeley, and you wouldn't believe what goes on every day when each identity group, um, literally, there are posters all over the buildings, don't say this, say that, at a university telling people how to speak, what they can say, uh, protest, which is all part of our history, and then uh, p protests that sometimes get violent, um, and then the university has, has to act. Um, Columbia's ha Columbia Barnes had an, a, a, a number of issues, some race, there's a huge um, a, a Jewish Muslim conflict going on here at Columbia, competing donors, uh, for me, one of the biggest issues at universities are donors, thank you very much for your money, but who we're now trying to control uh, who gets hired and what gets said. Um, my former dean, Erwin Chemerinsky, now the dean of the Berkeley Law School, has written a book on uh, speech on campus. Uh, and I don't agree with everything he says because I will say this, I am not, as a lawyer, a First Amendment absolutist. I believe that hate speech, true hate speech, should be regulated. It's not in the United States because we do have free speech. We talked earlier about heat. This is the kind of thing we could have another whole panel on for several hours. Americans and lawyers and liberals uh, disagree completely on this issue. Um, but um, uh, I think that the issue of what one can say and, and the intent of hurt and harm is very dramatic. Uh, and uh, it's very troubling to me that this, as I said earlier, this crucible of my political life, being, being able to do what I did despite the arrest that happened to our sisters here and some of our brothers across the street, universities are not the place for it anymore. So uh, we were all asked to think about what to ask young people to do. Uh, you have work to do in, at Barnard and Columbia, but I actually think the action's outside of the universities right now. Um, despite the fact we are supposed to be the place of engagement about uncontrover of controversial ideas, it's a really tough time. Um, so those who have kids, um, talk to them about this. Um, what they can say and do say in both their university settings and their work settings, uh, because this too is under assault in the United States and they're very complicated issues. Where, wherever the fight is, it's uneven. Mm -hmm. It's an uneven fight. I don't want to say that. And I want to say also, getting back to 1968, uh, Columbia was tripping on its power until it tripped itself up. Mm -hmm. This will happen. This yeah. is physics. Yeah. Also culture. <laughs> <laughs>